Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see you all here with your sunshiny, happy faces. I hope when you looked in the mirror this morning, you said, hi, handsome, or hi, beautiful, or something like that. I, I would like for you all to remember my family and your prayers for the next couple weeks. I cannot get off my mind this morning the fact that it was three years ago today that uh, I woke up in the middle of the night hearing, hearing my wife calling me. And I didn't see her. Not even when I looked in the sound of her voice. She had fallen out of bed or fallen when she was trying to get back in the bed or something, I'm not sure. And she was on the floor between the bed and the wall. And I couldn't get her up, so I got Ruth up and she couldn't get her up. And so Steve and Ruth were, came in and got him up. And we took her to the hospital. And that's where she stayed until she died 33 years, 33 days later. So uh, it's a, a rough time for my, my family and for me, so we need to remember that. Have you ever been asked a question that you can't answer? Have you ever been asked a question about the Bible that you can't answer? I was telling someone this morning, it was last Monday or Tuesday, and this is what put me in mind of uh, my, this, these, these things, that uh, I was at the grocery store, I believe it was Kroger's, and somebody walked up to me that knew me, called me by the name, and said, I have a Bible question for you, and boy, that makes me feel proud when somebody comes to me that I, I know and says, I have a Bible question for you, and I says, what's that? And she responded and says, what was Lot's wife's name? Now, I, I want you to know that the Bible does not give Lot's wife a name. So out of the clear blue sky, I responded by saying, Old Salt. <laughs> uh, now, I, I, I like that. I, I think sometimes the silly answer is about the only answer that we can give. But there are times that questions are asked that maybe can be answered reasonably without the authority of the scriptures. I, I, what I'm simply saying is when we put our thinking in scriptural terms and try to find a reasonable solution for the question that is being asked, sometimes those reasonable solutions can give a lesson for the day. And it's only speculation. It's only opinion. And my whole sermon this morning is going to be speculation and opinion. I want you to know that. But down through the years, I've heard many questions that uh, <laughs> give a reasonable answer. In, in fact, I wasn't too long, long here. And uh, I think Debbie, who asked the question one time in prayer meeting, uh, what is going to prevent the same thing happening all over again in the new world? And uh, I said, well, simply put, Satan's going to be destroyed, put in prison, chained for eternity. And uh, while we don't have any authority for that, it's an opinion. And I think we need to recognize that. But this morning, I, I like for us to really think about something that happened during the life of Jesus. This question has been asked to me over and over and over again down through the years. And I can remember when I was a youngster, I went to my preacher and asked him the same question. But how many of you have ever heard the term used in Peter, James, and John being the inner three or the inner circle? I heard one preacher say one time that they were elected by the other disciples to be the church board. I find no authority for that. I think I reject that almost immediately. But why did Jesus choose Peter, James, and John to be special? On several occasions in the Gospels, he took them aside for special experiences. <clears throat> why not Andrew? Why not Bartholomew? Why didn't I pronounce that right? Why, why, why not Matthew? <clears throat> why, why Peter, James, and John? But before we get involved with trying to find an answer for that, let, let's look at some of the scriptures that deal with when he took Peter, James, and John aside. 
If you recall, when after the Lord's Supper was served, Jesus went with his disciples out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there he left the disciples and took Peter, James, and John, and went a little bit further. And he told them to watch and pray, and then he went a little bit further and he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. He went back and Peter, James, and John were asleep. He woke them up and went back a little bit further and prayed again the second time, not my will, but thine be done. Why was it that Jesus took them aside on this special occasion? Now let's go back in the late ministry of Jesus Christ a little bit to the 17th chapter of the book of Matthew. There on a particular occasion, I think this was one of the most glorious occasions in the uh, ministry of Jesus Christ, he went up into a mountain and took Peter, James, and John with him. And as he took them up in the sky, and they, they looked around, and, uh, all of a sudden Jesus began to be transformed in front of them. His entire raiment became white as snow. His countenance became white as snow. Now I personally believe, and this is again another opinion, that Jesus Christ was assuming what is called the Shekinah, the glory of God in his appearance. But in that particular time, Moses and Elijah, the Old Testament figures, appeared with them. And Peter, James, and John were overwhelmed with what was happening. And Peter went to Jesus and said, Master, let's build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, Peter was a good old Jew. One man, Moses and Elijah were the, some of the greatest men of the Old Testament. And what Moses had in mind was to be able to sit, Peter had in mind was to sit down and be able to learn from each of these. And all of a sudden, a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son, hear him. And when they looked up around, they saw no man but Jesus. I think this is a way that Jesus, God, God was telling the disciples, you no longer are going to be bound by the law of Moses. You're no longer going to be bound by the prophets because Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of those things. And you hear my son. I think it's a great lesson for us today. But why? Why did he just take Peter, James, and John? Why not the other apostles? Or disciples. Well, what prevented him from taking Matthew, Bartholomew, or Thomas, or some of the other ones with him? There was another occasion in the fifth chapter of the book of Mark. The fifth chapter of the book of Mark, Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, came and visited and told Jesus, said, My daughter is sick, nigh unto death. Will you come and heal her? And Jesus went on his way. And as he was going his way, a woman touched the hem of his garment and the power removed from him. And he stopped and talked to the woman. Then he went a little bit further. And as they were coming to the synagogue, the place where Jairus' daughter was laying, they came to Jairus and said, Don't bother the master. Don't bother him anymore. For your daughter is dead. <clears throat> and Jesus took Peter, James, and John, went in where they were all crying and weeping over the death of this young lady. And Jesus says, she's not a dead, but she's dead, but she's alive. She's just sleeping. And he reached up and brought her back to life. Now, why was it? Why was it that Jesus just took Peter, James, and John? <clears throat> why not the other disciples? Why not the other ones? These questions have been asked over and over and over and over again. And any answer that you give as far as this is concerned is just merely trying to understand the mind of Jesus Christ. Any answer that you give is nothing but speculation and opinion, and your opinion is just as good as mine. In fact, I had thought about stopping my sermon right here and asking you to offer up your ideas of why. Why would Jesus pay special attention to Peter, James, and John? I'm going to offer some ideas. 
And I, I want you to think about what I'm saying. And I'm going to use some experiences in my own personal life in order to be able to emphasize my opinion. First of all, I think Jesus recognized in these three individuals the quality of leadership. And as a result, gave them special attention in order to develop that leadership within them. Now, I'm going to tell you some things that you might disagree with. But I, I think we all, every one of us, no matter how, what our age is, we all can do something as far as the kingdom is concerned. We, we pray every Sunday for the church to grow and for souls to be saved, but I think we all have a place. There, there is a hymn that we sing, there is a place for every worker in the vineyard of the Lord. And you find that oftentimes that God expects everyone who is a Christian, wearing the name of Christ, to become involved in some way, but we all don't have the same talent. We all don't have the same ability. And therefore, I think God will develop the abilities that you have in order to be able to use those talents in leadership in winning souls for Christ. Let me tell you about somebody. I, I personally cannot remember his name. I know his brother real well. He's an Abraham Lincoln lookalike. Sarah, Bill Sarah uh, is who I'm thinking of. But his brother when was a worker for the Goyi Chapel in New York City. This, this chapel went down the street corners and they, they uh, held services, dropped down the trailer that they pulled around with a little truck. And right there they had a pulpit, they had an organ, and they sang hymns right in the middle of the city. And they were able to win souls and begin churches by doing that. My brother was a part of that. But Bill Sarah's brother was one of the missionaries that was supported. I knew, knew him, but I, for the life of me, can't remember his name. He was one of the shyest people I think I've ever met. If he, you walk, he walked up to a stranger and tried to talk to him, he'd become tongue-tied. He couldn't speak. If you called on for prayer, he wished the floor would open and swallow him right there because he could not pray in public. He could not speak in public. He would go out to pass out some circulars and he would walk up in a door and if the people were there to see him come and open the door, he couldn't even talk to them. He was so shy and quote, quote, stage fright, end of quote. But what did, what did he do? What did he do? He was a printer by trade. And he took his printing press went up to New York City and joined himself with this particular organization. And every bit of printing that was done by that organization, he put into words. He edited it, he wrote it, he put it in the printing, and it was the means by which the Gogi Chapel was sent out into the community and souls were being saved. Here was a man that had a talent, not speaking, not meeting anybody, that God used him in such a way 